Well, we are getting ready for a holiday. October 31st, we'll be celebrating the Reformation. Not jack-o'-lanterns, not uh, witches on brooms and black cats and things like that. But we're going to be celebrating on October 31st an event that totally changed world history. So let's talk about the background. Let's talk about what led up to that. The first thing you need to know is that Jesus came to save sinners. He didn't come because there were some good people who needed rescuing. Remember the rich young ruler says to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Jesus wasn't denying his deity. Jesus was showing that young man that the rest of us aren't good. We may like to think we're good. We may like to feel good compared to other people. But Jesus says only God is good. So clearly salvation is not for good people. There were a lot of people who were very religious and thought they were good in Jesus' day, and they criticized Jesus for spending time socially at parties and things with people that were known as bad people. They were prostitutes and tax collectors and here Jesus was at Matthew's house spending time with folks like that. That was very upsetting to the religious types. Jesus said, I'm a physician. And a physician is here for those who are sick. Now, some people might say, you're calling me sick? Yeah, he was calling us sick. But the good news is he's the cure. He came to save sinners. He also promised us that those who trust in him would not only receive eternal life, but that in this world we should expect persecution. And that was indeed what followed, and there was horrible persecution of the early church. Many people were martyred, including St. Peter, who was crucified upside down. They were going to crucify him to kill him, and he said, I'm not worthy to die in the same way that my Lord died. And so in church history, we're taught that he was crucified upside down. Horrible, horrible persecution of the early church. And yet, in the midst of persecution, just as is happening today around the world, in the midst of persecution, the church grew dramatically. And as the church grew, the Roman Empire was in the process of decay. And more and more of the people of Rome were becoming believers that Jesus is the one who is Lord. That he is the King of Kings, the ruler of all rulers. And their loyalty was to him. Well, a fellow came along named Constantine. And Constantine was the first ruler of the Roman Empire, who professed faith in Jesus Christ. He claimed to see in the sky a vision of a cross and hear a voice saying, in this sign, conquer. So he adopted the cross, which the Christians, the persecuted Christians held dear. He adopted the cross as the symbol for his armies, for his empire, and he conquered the Roman Empire, became the ruler of the Roman Empire, and declared himself a Christian, and declared not only that Christians were not to be persecuted any longer, the way they had been, but that Christianity was the true religion. Well, my goodness, that seemed like a huge victory for the church. We're not going to be persecuted anymore. But it presented a new problem. Tons of people who were not Christians decided, yeah, me too. Me too. I'll be a Christian. And so the church was now flooded with people claiming to be Christian, professing that they had had a religious experience, they were now believers, they wanted to 
be part of this Christian thing. And it became very difficult to tell who's who. You have to get to know people in order to know whether or not they're really living out their faith. Have you ever encountered somebody? I remember a fellow in Knoxville some years ago who was a total swindler and liar. And he had a nice ichthus on his business sign and made much of the fact that he was a Christian. But I talked with him face to face about the fact that God promises that all liars will spend eternity in hell. And I said, based on our dealings, you need to really consider whether you're a Christian. Because the man was a liar. He was a swindler. He was a crook. And that is evidence that he wasn't really a Christian. Would you agree? It's not just what we profess with our lips, it's what we live with our lives. And you can say something that's not true. If I came in here this morning and said, hey, guess what? Publisher's Clearinghouse just called, and uh, I've won $100 million. And uh, after this is over, I'm going to go get my hair cut. W would you believe me? I'm, no, because I'd be going, ah! Um, so, you know, if I'm just calmly telling you that, uh, you know, I've won $100 million, but nothing's going to change, nothing's going to change, it casts real doubt on whether or not I have indeed received $100 million. Correct? Well, if you're saying that you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and your life doesn't show any change, that's more unbelievable than saying you've won $100 million and your life hasn't changed. And there are tons of people who claim to be Christian and may even think they are Christian, but they don't know Jesus. So, around 300 A.D. was the game-changing moment with Constantine, the first Christian Roman Empire. Well, now the church grew numerically, and it grew financially, and it became enmeshed with the government, and it was an interesting time for about 700 years. And there were beautiful buildings being built, some of which are still around, and uh, libraries being developed, and all kinds of amazing things happening in the name of Christianity. Not all of it was Christian. In 1054, there came a split within the church between the bishop of the East and the bishop of the West. The bishop of the East in Constantinople, the bishop of the West in Rome. The church split over a number of issues. But a whole lot of what was at the heart of those issues was power, status. The bishop of Rome saying, I'm the top bishop. Everybody else has to submit to me. Bishop of Constantinople saying, I'm not about to submit to you. Why should I submit to you? And so, for the record, the Bishop of Constantinople was not saying that the Bishop of Rome needed to submit to him. In other words, Constantinople didn't say, I'm number one. The Bishop of Rome said, I'm number one. The Bishop of Constantinople said, eh, no, not really. Now, there were doctrinal issues. There were differences in belief, differences that most people in the Eastern Church and the Western Church to this day don't understand or, or believe. It's not like people in the West say, well, you know, they don't believe like we do. They believe this, we believe this. Yeah, it's like, uh, they don't believe like we do. Well, what's the difference? Oh, I don't know. I just know that they're different, okay? And that's, that's pretty much where it stood for a thousand years. There's a split between the East and the West. But then some other things started to happen. Remember now, you've got people in positions of power within the church who aren't even necessarily trusting God for their salvation. Many of them had been taught 
that they were saved by what they did rather than by what Jesus did when he died on the cross to save us. And so, a fellow came along, born in 1320. His name was John Wycliffe. He was a professor at Oxford University in England. And Wycliffe was a great scholar, and in studying the scriptures, he began to see huge differences between what the church was saying and what the scriptures said. And Wycliffe said, I believe the scriptures. And I want other people to be able to read the scriptures, since not everybody can read Latin, which was the scholarly language going back to the Roman civilization. Since not everybody can read that, I'm going to put the scriptures in the language of the people. And he did. He put it in Middle English, which was the language of the time. Well, this was a huge threat to the powerful church establishment. Because if the people could read the Bible for themselves, they would realize, as Wycliffe had, that what the church was saying was not what the Bible said. And so Wycliffe and his followers became a real threat to the church in England. Meanwhile, about 80 years later, in the middle of Europe, in a place called Prague, in the Czech Republic, there was another professor, another scholar, who not only learned about what Wycliffe had written, but based on Wycliffe's encouragement through Wycliffe's writings, he began to study the scriptures for himself too. What does it say? What does the Bible actually say? And he reached the same kind of conclusions that Wycliffe had a generation before. And he began to preach the gospel and people started getting saved and great things were happening. Lives were being changed. But the powerful people in the church, in the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia or Prague, and surrounding area, because that whole thing has changed governments many times, many times. The people who were in power demanded that Jan Hus, John Hus, stop preaching the truth. He refused because it is the truth. And so he was killed. He was martyred. William Tyndale, 1536, died, having again said back in England, we've got to get the scriptures into the hands of the people. Because when they read the scriptures, they will see for themselves that Jesus is the only way of salvation. It's not about what building you go to, it's not about who your priest is, it's about Jesus, trusting him. Well then why don't we celebrate John Wycliffe or Jan Hus or William Tyndale? Why do we celebrate Martin Luther? I mean, these guys were great. And Tyndale came right after Luther in this line. Why doesn't he get as much press? Because Martin Luther, in the providence of God, got to do something that absolutely threw the door open for everybody else. Okay? What did he do? Well, in Germany, there was a fundraising program going on. The church in Rome was seeking to build a magnificent structure. Magnificent. It got built. It's there today. You can go see it. And in order to build that magnificent structure, they needed money. So they went out to where they had followers in places, not just in Italy, but in places like Germany. And they told the people, you need to give. But the people weren't giving enough 
to satisfy the financial needs and ambitions down in Rome. So, they came up with a, an ingenious plan. And it's, it's totally genius as long, as long as you don't care about what's true. What they said is, you've heard about people dying and going to heaven. You've heard about people dying and going to hell. There is another place. It's called purgatory. It's a place for people who aren't quite ready to go to heaven. They've not lived the way they should have lived. They've died with some sins unconfessed. They've died owing a debt still. And um, they're going to have to spend some time in purgatory suffering. And then after they've suffered enough, they can get free and go on up to heaven. Now, if you have any loved ones who've died, you know that right now they're suffering. Because that's what happens. We can get them out. We can end their suffering and let them go right on to heaven if you'll give us some money. We will sell what's called indulgences. Okay? Indulgences. This is a a pardon. And, You know, I mean, if they're a really bad person, it's going to cost you more money. If it was grandma and uh, she was pretty good, she just wasn't perfect, okay? We can can get her out for less, all right? But um, if you love your grandma, you certainly don't want her suffering in purgatory. So give us your money and we'll give you a piece of paper that says she gets to go to heaven right now. And there were people who were falling for that. Now you say, why would anybody believe that kind of scam? Because they didn't have Bibles. They didn't have a Bible in their own language. They couldn't understand what the Bible said. They didn't even understand what the priests said when they went to church. When they went to the church trying to draw near to God, the priest spoke in a language they didn't understand. And so... Who knows? I just want to do what I'm told. You tell me what to do, I'll do it. Just, you know, please. I don't want to be in trouble with God. I know there is a God. I can tell that this world didn't get here by chance. Life is not a mistake or random chance. It's, it's clearly a designer, I can tell. And, and I know in my heart that I've done things I shouldn't have done. I've, I've violated God's law and, and I've been preached to that I I need to get right with God, so tell me what I have to do to get right with God. And instead of being told, call on the Lord, ask His forgiveness, they were being told, give us your money. We'll make it right. We'll talk to God for you. And that was the climate in Europe in the early 1500s. And Martin Luther had been a part of that. He was a Roman Catholic priest. And he took it very seriously, but he had this great struggle within himself because no matter how much stuff he did that he was told he must do, he still could tell not all is right between himself and God. And then, as he studied the Scriptures, he was blessed with a great intellect and a great education. And as he studied the scriptures, he found in the book of Romans the gospel of righteousness that comes from God. Take a look in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. This was the passage that totally changed Martin Luther's life. The Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. That word gospel means good news. For I am not ashamed of the good news, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it, 
the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. When Luther read that, it it totally changed his life. He began to understand what the Apostle Paul develops by way of argument in this letter to the church at Rome. And that is, nobody is saved by our good works. Nobody. Paul says that more than once in this letter. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by keeping the law. Why? Because we all break the law. We've all violated God's commands. All of us. It's not some of us. How dare you say that about me? Well, because you're breathing. Okay? You're human. And therefore, I know that like me, you've messed up. I'm not singling you out for criticism. All of us, he says in this letter, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. We deserve to be cut off from God. But God, who's rich in mercy, sent Jesus to die on the cross in our place. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. It's John 3.16. The next verse is like unto it. For God didn't send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but so that through Him the world might be saved. That's what changes everything. It's what God did, not us. We're not saved by doing something to earn our salvation. You couldn't possibly earn it. If my wife makes the, the best soup of anybody in the world. Sorry, Miss Claire. My wife is an absolutely fabulous cook, and her soup is absolutely fantastic. So if we invited the whole ranch family to gather at our house and we're going to have my wife's soup, you'd all be in for a treat, especially when the weather gets cooler and, you know, it's, it's got that nip in the air. We say, we're going to have soup. My wife is making soup. Isn't that great? You may say, well, I'm not a big fan of soup. Well, you haven't tasted my wife's soup, okay? I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. So... You're all coming up to the house. You're going to be there in just about 15 minutes. I'm doing, sorry, I'm having a little trouble uh, before you get there, but I'm, I, I think I'm going to be okay. And I go by in the kitchen just to check on the soup, and unfortunately, I'm sorry, unfortunately as I walk by where the big pot of soup is being prepared, I throw up in the soup. Oh no, what'll we do? My wife says, don't worry. I can add some more seasoning. (laughs) Would my wife do that? Not a chance in the world. She'd say, what have you done? What am I going to feed all these people? They're coming here for my soup. You just threw up in the soup. We've got to throw this out now. And I say, no, 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 I think we can save it. No! It cannot be saved. You can't add things to it to make it better. We'll water it down, okay? Can you tell what came from you? No! We don't do that. Once you've thrown up in the soup, the soup is ruined. Once you and I have sinned, we can't just fix our lives. We can't do something to improve. We can't just hope that our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds. It's ruined. Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born again. You need a brand new life. Your righteousness is not going to cut it. The only righteousness that is holy before God is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so, the Bible says our righteousness, our good deeds, are like filthy rags in God's sight. You and I can't 
fix the mess we've made. But Jesus doesn't come and say, all right, I'll show you how it's done, and then you imitate me, and if you do a good enough imitation of me, you can come into heaven too. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way of salvation. The Bible says there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the only way. He's the only one. I can't be saved by what I do. I can only be saved by Jesus. Luther recognized that and then, having trusted in Jesus Christ for his salvation, was absolutely appalled, horrified by what he saw the church doing to exploit the people of his community. The idea that the church would sell a piece of paper that was based on a lie saying, if you give us your money, we can get your loved one out of purgatory. In fact, we can even sell it to you as an insurance policy. If you'll pay us enough money, we can give you an indulgence that'll get you out when you die. You can bypass purgatory, go straight to heaven. Okay? So here's, here's the deal. Luther who became angrier and angrier about the lies that were being told by the church in his day, wrote out 95 statements saying these things are true and anybody who disagrees, I'll be happy to debate them. And he took those 95 statements and he nailed them to the door of the local church, which was the bulletin board where he was the pastor. Okay? He wasn't vandalizing the church, he was the pastor of the church. And the door of the church was used as the bulletin board. This chapel we're building has beautiful doors. They are not a bulletin board. I don't even want scotch tape on the doors. Okay? But Luther nailed the 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg church. And people began to read them, and they made sense. Now, he did it on October 31st, because October 31st was the night before, the day before, they were going to have the big sale. There's more to this story. I'll just allude to it briefly. In the British Isles, there was a great deal of witchcraft and worship of a demonic being referred to as Samhain, Lord of the Dead. People in the British Isles had been pagans for centuries. They had their own mythology, their own set of lies. And when the church went into Great Britain, the idea was, oh, we don't want them engaged in all this kind of witchcraft, how can we get them to come over and start doing things our way? And so they changed the date that had been previously the celebration of All Saints Day, where you remembered those who've died and gone on. They changed the date to November 1st to coincide with this pagan festival in the British Isles, where they celebrated Samhain, Lord of the Dead, on October 31st. And the idea was, we'll let them have their pagan celebrations, October 31st. But the next day, we'll invite everybody to come to church, and we'll celebrate the faith. Okay? That way, we, we sort of bring the two things together, and pretty soon, people feel like, I don't have to give up my witchcraft in order to be a part of the church. Isn't that a nice plan? Okay? Still being done today. Have you ever heard of Carnival? Okay. Mardi Gras? These are pagan celebrations filled with debauchery, all kinds of immorality, drunkenness, and that's what leads up to Lent. Okay. We're going to have this horrible pagan revelry followed by now we're Christians again. Okay. And that has been the strategy for centuries in getting people who aren't Christian to think they are because it's good for business. Luther 
recognizing that the big sale of indulgences was going to take place on November 1st, All Saints Day. That's when you'd be going to the church to remember the memory of your loved one who has died. So the day before the big sale, he puts up a sign saying, don't buy their indulgences. It's all based on a lie. Jesus is the only way. Put your trust in him. Don't send your money to Rome. Keep it here in Germany. He had a little bit of Trump in him. Okay? Keep your money here in Germany. Don't send it off to a foreign country. Why should we give our money to the Italians? Now, Luther put up a sign saying, don't buy the indulgences. The people who read that sign, it was written in German, were like, wow, I think he's right. And so it really hurt the sale of indulgences, and that upset the folks back in Rome. Got it? But Luther was a feisty fellow, and he had the support of a bunch of German politicians because he appealed not just to logic and reasoning, but, and not only to scripture, but also to German nationalism. And so there were leaders in Germany who said, yeah, why should we be sending our money down there to Italy? I, I think this Luther guy is right. Let's support him. Let's protect him. Because eventually the folks in Rome wanted him dead. Now let me tell you this. Luther was a very imperfect man. He had real faults, real flaws. But God used him to swing the door open for people to begin to question what they'd been taught, to read the Bible in their own language. Luther translated the Bible into German and made it available. And another fellow, who was not a theologian, he was just an inventor, had come up with something shortly before. It was called the movable type printing press. It was an invention in technology. The Gutenberg Press. Gutenberg was the place where it was developed. I've been to Gutenberg. And with the movable type, they could print Luther's 95 Theses and his other writings, including the German Bible, in mass quantities and sell it inexpensively to the people of Germany. So you had technology coming along at the same time as this tremendous theological revolution. And let me tell you, the consequence of that stand by Luther was that people were emboldened all over Europe, back in the United Kingdom, in, in uh, Great Britain, all over, people were given courage and they were given materials. And you talk about a best-selling book, Luther's debates with those who wanted to disagree with him became what everybody was reading, even in other countries in Europe, okay? I, I don't know if you know this, but I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to disillusion you. America is not the place where everybody knows the most, okay? Esther speaks English, but of course, being from Germany, she also speaks German. Esther, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Do you speak any other languages? No, okay, only two, only two. Now, if she was Swiss, she would speak at least three, okay? Very probably four, but she's just a German, okay? <laughs> so she doesn't need more than German and English. That's enough. But a person who speaks three languages is called trilingual. A person who speaks two languages is called bilingual. A person who speaks only one language is called an American. <laughs> okay? In, in Europe, back in the 1500s, many people beyond Germany 
spoke German. It was an influential language. And people began to get the scriptures in their languages. And people in other countries began to say, we ought to do this for our people. And let me tell you, the Roman church was suddenly fighting for its life. Because the fact is, if the people read the book, if they read the scriptures, they're going to make up their own minds about what's true and what's false. And that was scary. You say, well, that was a long time ago, 1517. Why? That's 500 years. 500 years. That's time for a big celebration, wouldn't you say? But that's 500 years ago. Surely all of this is way in the past. No, let me tell you, in my own lifetime, there's been dramatic change and reformation within the Roman Catholic Church. In my lifetime, the church has changed its position on things like whether or not we want people to be able to read the Bible in their own language, whether or not the church service is going to be in the language of the people. And there was a conference called Vatican II, and the Roman Catholic Church, to their credit, said, yeah, people ought to be able to read the Bible in their own language, and when they go to church, they ought to be able to understand what's going on. Let's start doing the service that way. Now, there are people like Mel Gibson, the actor, who says, no, 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 keep it in Latin. Keep it in Latin. I don't want to know too much. Okay? But the Roman Catholic Church has, in my lifetime, changed their position on some of these things. That's great. About two or three years ago, there was even approval of a proposal that the Roman Catholic Church should honor Martin Luther for his contributions in church history. And it passed! <laughs> Isn't that nice? I'm telling you this because our purpose in the celebration is not to attack any other group. Our purpose is to celebrate the gospel. Let me share with you two scriptures. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1 says that even in his day there were people who veered away from what scripture teaches. Verse 6 of Galatians 1. I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, he says, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we preach to you, a curse be on him. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you've received, a curse be on him. And St. Peter, writing in 2 Peter chapter 1, says, Above all, you know this. No prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation. Because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. St. Peter says, if you want to know what to believe, know this above all else. The Scriptures are inspired by God. That's the basis of authority. That's how you decide what's true and what's false, what's the real gospel. St. Peter says, in Holy Scripture, that Holy Scripture is the authority. That's where you find what's true. It's not the invention of man. And no matter what a person's title is, no matter what their education is, no matter what miracles they may do, if what they say doesn't line up with Scripture, it's not true. That's why it's vitally important that we have the Scriptures in our own language. 
so that we can understand them. One of my radio listeners wrote to me and said, my husband is insisting that if I'm going to teach the children from the Bible, I need to use the Catholic Bible. I said, use it. Use it. Use it. It's not a problem. If you are listening today and you're wondering, uh, how do I know which Bible's right? Pick one and say to God, I want to know the truth and God will guide you because he will. We're not dealing here with a recipe. We're dealing with a living Lord. God himself is the one who loved us so much that he sent Jesus to save us. And I want you to know him, not just know about him. I don't want you just to believe that there is a God. I want you to be able to call him Father. Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, may your name be hallowed. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want you to know him. And I want you to long for his will to be done in your life. And if that is your desire, God will answer that prayer, yes. Don't miss out. We have a lot to celebrate. And that's why on October 31st, we're going to have a party. Amen? All right. Father, thank you so much for your amazing grace, for loving us, not because we're good, but because you're good. Thank you for sending Jesus to be the one who took away our sin. Help us now to believe the good news, and we will give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.